Hi everyone, it is Atia here at Booking It with Atia, and I am coming to you with a summer book haul. Now, this was originally just supposed to be books that I bought during Barnes & Noble annual 50% off hardcover sale, and then I went and I bought a bunch of comics this weekend, and I also had two special editions arrive in the mail, and I was just like, you know what, we'll just compile all these into one book haul because they all kind of arrived into my life at the same time time. So we're going to do this in four sections. First, I'll talk about the books that I bought at the Black Girl Book Fest, which happened on August 19th in Brooklyn, mixed with the special editions that I recently acquired. Then I'll move on into the comics and manga that I picked up from Barnes & Noble this weekend. And then we'll slide on into the books that I purchased from their 50% off hardcover sale. So I'm really excited about all these purchases. Purchases. Some of them I've already read and then I acquired and some of them I have not read and it was just a matter of perusing. So let's jump right in. First up we have Homebodies by Tembi Denton Hurst. I got this at the Black Girl Book Fest on August 19th like I said from the Books Are Magic table and it is actually a signed edition of this book. I've already read this book. I read it a few months ago I listened to the audiobook and I enjoyed it. I thought that the characterization was interesting. It's definitely a book that I would put in the same vein as Queenie or Honey Girl. I have not read Luster or Mame yet but I believe they also fit into that same category of like millennial black girl whose life is spiraling and she's just trying to like put it back together. There is the signed edition. For all of these I am going to read the synopsis and if I I, if editing me can figure out how to like make markers or sections in YouTube so that you know where each section starts she will do that birds please stop doing that um but yeah so let's get into it Mickey Hayward dreams of writing stories that matter she has a flashy media job that makes her feel successful and a devoted girlfriend who takes care of her when she becomes home when she comes home exhausted and demoralized oh my god be quiet it's not all a-list media parties and steamy romance but Mickey's on her way and is far from the messy life she left behind in Maryland. Despite being overlooked and mistreated at work, everything finally seems to be falling into place until she finds out she's being replaced. Distraught and enraged, Mickey fires back with a detailed letter outlining the racism she's endured as a black woman in media, certain it will change the world for the better. But when her letter is met with overwhelming silence, Mickey is sent into a tailspin of self-doubt, forced to reckon with just how fragile her life is, including the uncertainty of her relationship. She flees to the last place she ever dreamed she would run to, her hometown desperate for a break from her troubles. Back home, Mickey is seduced by the simplicity of her old life and the flirtation of a former flame. But the life she left behind in New York refuses to be forgotten. When a media scandal catapults Mickey's forgotten letter into a public zeitgeist, is that how you pronounce that word? Suddenly, everyone wants to hear what Mickey has to say. It's what she's always wanted, isn't it? Insightful, funny, and deeply sexy, Homebodies is a testament to those trying to be heard and loved in a world that refuses refuses to make space and introduces a standout new writer. The other thing I picked up from the Black Girl Book Fest is The Sentence by Louise Erdrich. This is my second book of this author. I read Future Home of the Living God a few years ago. I did not enjoy it, but that was also this author's first foray into like sci-fi, literary sci-fi. So I figured I would give her literary fiction a try. And so The Sentence ask what we owe to the living, to the dead, to the reader, and to the book. A small independent bookstore in Minneapolis is haunted from November 2019 to November 2020 by the store's most annoying customer. Flora dies on All Souls Day, but she simply won't leave the store. Chuki, who has landed a job selling books after years of incarceration that she survived by reading with murderous attention, must solve the mystery of this haunting while at the same time trying to understand all that occurs 
Rivers in Minneapolis during a year of grief, astonishment, isolation, and furious reckoning. The sentence begins on All Souls Day 2019 and ends on All Souls Day 2020. Its mystery and proliferating ghost stories during this one year propel a narrative as rich, emotional, and profound as anything Louise Erdrich has written. So when I picked this up, like I had heard about it. I didn't know what it was, but the title was familiar to me. But when I read the synopsis, I was like, oh my goodness, like, yes, please. Thank you. Now let's move on to the special editions that I acquired. This is The Bruising of Kilwa by Nassim Jamnia. This is the Rainbow Crate edition. Isn't this absolutely gorgeous? I had the arc and I read the book. Was that last summer or last fall? I think it was. And I really enjoyed it. So when I saw this cover and during an author chat that Beat You Weird had, it was brought up, it was mentioned. And once I saw the cover, I was like, I absolutely have to get this. And then the inside, look at that. And then the naked book looks like this. <laughs> Isn't that just stunning? So I do want to go back through it or go through it at some point and highlight and underline what I annotated in my arc copy. But yeah, oh, I should probably tell you what this is about. <laughs> oh, let me see, where is the, the synopsis? It's not on the inside dust jacket, so I'm going to pull up the story graph. So I apologize if you can hear the AC, not the AC, the fan in the background. It is very warm in my room, and the only way I would get through filming this is if the fan was on in some capacity. All right, so it says, ba, 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 ba. here we go. Farouz A. Jafari is fortunate enough to have immigrated to the free democratic city state of Kilwa, fleeing, fleeing the slaughter of other traditional Sasanian blood magic practitioners in their homeland. Despite the status of refugees in their new home, Farouz has a good job at a free healing clinic in Kilwa, working with Kofi, a kindly new employer, and mentoring Af Afsona a troubled orphan f refugee with powerful magic. But Farouz and Kofi have discovered a terrible new disease which leaves mysterious bruises on its victims. The illness is spreading quickly through Kilwa, and there are dangerous accusations of ineptly performed blood magic. In order to survive, Farouz must break a deadly cycle of prejudice, untangle socio-political constraints, and find a fresh start for their for both their blood and found family so yeah i've already read it i liked it i gave 4.25 stars next up we have forged by blood which is book one of the tainted blood duology by ahigbor okusan this is the saddest fiction edition which as you can see i have not opened yet so we're going to do that now there we go oh, look at that I don't think the camera is going to pick up just how red this is because it looks like it's coming out more orange. Ugh. I have a letter from the author as well as a nameplate, book plate, whatever this is called that I'm going to put in here once I get the chance. But in terms of what this is about, in the midst of an authoritarian regime and political invasion, Demi just wants to survive, to avoid the suspicion of the non-magical edges who occupy her ancestral homeland of Ife, to to escape King Sorensen's brutal genocide of her people, the darker-skinned, magic-wielding Oluso, and to live peacefully with her secretive mother while learning to control the terrifying blood magic that is her birthright. But when Demi's misplaced trust costs her mother's life, survival gives way to vengeance. She bides her time until the devious Lord Equenzi grants her the perfect opportunity kidnap the Eje Prince Jonas and bargain with his life to save the remaining Oluso. With the help of her reckless childhood friend Colin, Deme succeeds, but discovers that she and Jonas share more than deadly secrets. Every moment tangles them further in a forbidden, unmistakable attraction, much to Colin's and Demi's distress. The kidnapping is now a joint mission, to return to the king, help get Lord Equenzi on the council, and bolster the voice of the Oluso and a system designed to silence them. But the way is dangerous, Demi's magic is growing yet uncertain, and she's not sure if she can trust the two men at her side. A tale of rebellion and redemption, race and class, love and trust and betrayal. Forged by Blood is 
epic fantasy at its finest from an enthusiastic emerging voice. Okay, whoever wrote this synopsis did the damn thing because that 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 is how you write a synopsis for a book, especially a fantasy book. Like I know enough, but not too much about what's going to happen. But yeah, I was already very excited for this. The moment that I read what it was about and the moment that the cover was released, but now I'm more excited. I'm reinvigorated. Don't know when I'll get to it. Hopefully before 20. 23 is over hopefully all right next up let us head into the comics and manga that i got from barnes and noble over the weekend i figure we can start with the only manga that i got which is snow white with the red hair volume one i borrowed the e-copy of this book from the library because i well i was interested and i read it and if you don't know what i do with manga for series that i'm currently reading i buy volume one to keep in my collection just so i have a physical representation of that series and then if there are any five star volumes after that I gradually add them to the series but because I know that I am going to be continuing with this series I wanted to get volume one so what is this about Shiryuki is famous for her naturally bright red hair and the prince of Tanbaran wants her all to himself but when she escapes into the woods of the neighboring kingdom a young man named Zen and his two friends come to her aid but who is Zen really this volume also features a special one-shot colorful season of August. I find it really engaging. I like the main character Shiryuki. She's very independent just from like the very beginning of the story. She's like, yeah, no, I'm not about to become some random dude's concubine just because he likes my red hair. And she's like, I'm out. So yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing on with this manga series. Next up, we have Ayanu Child of Wonder Volume 2. Um, I'm not going to read the synopsis of this one because it's Volume 2, so I will grab my Volume 1. Ayanu, a teenage orphan with no recollection of her past, suddenly discovers that she has abilities that rival the ancient deities spoken of in the folklore of her people. It is these abilities that are the key to bringing back an age of wonders, as Ayanu begins her journey to save a world on the brink of of destruction. The corrupt, cursed wildlife and strange divine beasts are determined to destroy humanity unless Ayanu can stop. Pretty straightforward. I enjoyed the storyline of volume one, hence why I went and got volume two, and it looks more promising and like the artwork got a little better. So looking forward to hopefully reading this. Well, August is almost up, but maybe I'll read this by the end of the month. We'll see. Can we just take a moment? Oh. Next up, we have four comics that I had no idea they existed until I went to Barnes and Nobles and was just perusing. First up, we have Seven Secrets, Volume 1. This says, this says, For centuries, the Order has trusted in keepers and holders to guard the secrets and seven briefcases against all harm. But when their stronghold is attacked and the secrets put in peril, the entire Order must face their greatest fear, an enemy who knows too much and is willing to kill to get what he wants. Now, the Order's newest member, Casper, must discover the truth of the secrets before the enemy does or risk losing everything. A new series about seven powerful secrets, words, wonders, weapons, and worse, with the power to change the world. And we have The Dead Lucky, Volume 1, The Good Die Young. San Francisco is changing. Tech Consortium Morrow is building the city of the future with peacekeeper robots looming on every corner. And wherever Morrow isn't, the Salvation Gang is. Bibiana Lopez Young is changing to the incident in Afghanistan that killed her platoon let her control electricity and left her haunted by the ghost of those she lost. If she can hold it together, she might be able to save her city. But against an enemy this powerful, it won't be enough to be good. She'll have to be lucky. Then we have Safe Sex Volume 1 from notorious kink writer Tina Horn and featuring a diverse group of artists including Jen Hickman, Michael Dowling, Alejandra Gutierrez, and Tula Latoy come Safe Sex, a social thriller about sex, love, and torture. It's sex criminals in Gilead, hustlers with a sunstone twist. <laughs> That's hilarious. And a draconian American where sexuality is strictly bureaucratized and policed 
A group of queer sex workers keep the magic alive in an underground club called the Dirty Mind. Using their unique talents for bondage and seduction, they resolve to infiltrate the mysterious government pleasure center, free their incarcerated friends, and fight the power. Next up, we have Cosmo Nights by Hannah Templer. I believe this is a graphic novel, as in the whole story is encased in the one volume. But where is the... Pan's life used to be very small. Work in her dad's body shop, sneak out with her friend Tara to go dancing, and watch the skies for freighter ships. It didn't even matter that Tara was a princess, until one day it very much did matter, and Pan had to say goodbye forever. Years later, when a charismatic pair of off-world gladiators show up on her doorstep, she finds that life may not be as small as she thought. On the run and off the galactic grid, Pan discovers the astonishing secrets of her neo-medieval world, and the intoxicating possibility of burning it all down down. That is it for comics and manga. So now let's go on to the seven hardcovers that I bought during the Barnes & Noble 50% off sale. Some of these books were already on my radar and some of them I found just by perusing which is always a nice thing. First up, we have Night Wherever We Go by Tracy Rose Payton. On a struggling Texas plantation, six enslaved women slip from their sleeping quarters and gather in the woods under the cover of night. The Lucys, as they call the plantation owners after Lucifer himself, have decided to turn around the farm's bleak financial prospects by making the women bear children, bringing on a stockman to impress them. Now each woman must make a choice. Nan, the healer of the group, has brought a sack of cotton root clippings, which can stave off pregnancy when chewed daily. If they all take part, maybe they can keep the man from returning, whereas a child born of him will only encourage the Lucys further. Not to mention the plan itself. If discovered, they will all be in grave danger visceral and arresting night wherever we go illuminates each woman's individual trials and desires while painting a subversive portrait of collective defiance unflinching in her portrayal of america's greatest injustices while also deeply attentive to the transcendence love and solidarity of women whose interior lives have been underexplored. Tracy Rose Payton creates a story of unforgettable power. Then we have Wade and the Water by Nayani Karuma. Resonant with the emotional urgency of Alex Walker's classic Meridian and the poignant charm of Sumunk Kids' The Secret Life of Bees, Wade and the Water tells the story of an unforgettable summer in 1982, seen largely through the eyes of Ella, a young, mistreated black 11-year-old girl who lives with Leroy, who resents her, and Ma, who cannot stand to look at her. Ella's world is changed when Catherine St. James, a mysterious white researcher from Princeton, arrives in the racially divided Mississippi town. The community is immediately suspicious. What does Catherine want, and why is she really there? As tensions mount and rumors swirl, and the tide swings against her, Ella and Catherine are drawn into a complicated friendship that silences the outside world until it doesn't. Soon, the relationship grows increasingly fraught as Ella unwittingly pushes against Catherine's carefully constructed boundaries that guard a complicated past with secrets that could have devastating consequences. Told in the lyrical voices of both Ella and Catherine St. James, this moving coming-of-age story, replete with heartache and love, cruelty and laughter, is an exquisite and explosive novel that will keep you spellbound until the last page. Then we have Carmen and Grace by Melissa Cos Aquino. Carmen and Grace have been inseparable since they were little girls. More like sisters than cousins, survivors of a childhood marked by neglect and addiction and a system that never valued them. 
For too long, all they had was each other. That is, until Doña Durka swept into their lives and changed, taking Grace into her home, providing stability and support, and playing an outsized role in Carmen's upbringing too. Durka is more than a beneficent force in their Bronx neighborhood. She's also the leader of an underground drug empire, a larger-than-life matriarch who understands the vital importance of taking what power she can on a world too often ruled by violent men. So when Durka dies suddenly under mysterious circumstances, Carmen and Grace's lives are thrown into chaos. Grace has been primed to take over and has grand plans to expand the business, but Carmen is ready to move on from the shadow of Durka and her high expectations, and most of all from always looking over her shoulder in fear. She's also harboring a secret. She's pregnant and starting to show, and desperate to build a new life before the baby arrives. But how can Carmen leave the only family she's ever known? This tight sisterhood of women known as the DOD, a group of lost girls turned skilled professionals under Durka's guiding hand, all bound in their spirituality and merciless support of one another. Especially now, outside threats are circling and Grace's plans are speeding recklessly forward. As tough and tender as its main character, Carmen and Grace will grab readers from the first page with this raw depth of feeling and heart-pounding plot. A moving meditation on the choices of women and the legacy of violence. It's a devastatingly wise and intimate story about the bonds of female friendship, ambition, and found family. Next up, we have The Unfortunate by J.K. Chuku. Sahara is not okay. Entering her sophomore year, she already feels like a failure. Her body is too much, her love life is non-existent, she's not Nigerian enough for her family, her grades are subpar, and, well, the few black classmates she has are vanishing or dying. Sahara herself is close to giving up. Depression has been her longtime life partner. She believes that this narrative, taking the form of an irreverent, no-holds-barred thesis addressed to the powerful university committee that will judge her, may be her last chance to document the unfortunate's experiences before she joins their rank. But maybe, just maybe, she and her complex community of BIPOC women aren't ready to go out without a fight. And this is one of the ones that I just happened upon on their website, and I was immediately taken in by the cover and then by the synopsis. Next up, we have Rosewater by Liv Little. Elsie is a sexy, funny, and fiercely independent woman in South London. But at just 28, she is also tired. Though she spends her days writing tender poetry in her journal, her nights are spent working long hours for minimum wage at a neighborhood dive bar. Not even sleeping with her alluring co-worker, Bia, can quell her existential dread. The struggle of being estranged from her family and fear of never making money doing what she loves is too great. Still, Elsie is determined to keep the faith. For a little longer, at least, things will surely turn around. But when El Elsie... Have I been saying Elise this entire time? But when Elsie is suddenly evicted from her social housing, her fragile foundation threatens to collapse entirely. With nowhere left to go, she turns to her childhood friend, Juliet, for help. As the days at Juliet's turn into weeks and then months, Elsie finds herself finally able to breathe. But between her, their reruns of Drag Race and nights smoking on the balcony, it is not long before something else, unexpected and yet totally undeniable, begins to glimmer in Elsie's heart. Sometimes the thing you've been searching for has been there all along. Will Elsie see it in time? Also, I just love this cover. It's so simplistic, but it just, it just works. Then we have What Happened to Ruthie Ramirez by Claire Jimenez. The Ramirez women of Staten Island orbit around absence. When 13-year-old middle child Ruthie disappeared without a trace, it left the family scarred and scrambling. One night, 12 years later, oldest sister Jessica spots a woman on her TV screen in a raunchy reality show. She rushes to tell her younger sister Nina. This woman's hair is dyed red and she calls herself Ruby, but the beauty mark under her left eye is instantly recognized. Could it be Ruthie after all this time? The years since Ruthie's disappearance hasn't been easy on the Ramirez family. It's 2008 
and their mother Dolores still struggles with the loss. Jessica juggles a newborn baby with her hospital job and Nina after four years at college has returned home to medical school rejections and works at the lingerie store in the mall folding tiny bedazzled thongs. <laughs> After seeing Maybe Ruthie on their screen, Jessica and Nina hatch a plan to drive to where the show is filmed and find their long lost sister. When Dolores catch, catches wind of their scheme, she insists on joining, along with her pot stirring, holy roller best friend. What follows is a family road trip and reckoning that will force the Ramirez women to finally face the past and look toward a future with or without Ruby. Then we have The God of Good Looks by Brianne McIver on another cover that's just... Bianca Bridge has always dreamed of becoming a writer, but Trinidadian society can be unforgiving and having an affair with a married government official is a surefire way to prospects. So when Obadiah Cortland, a notoriously tyrannical entrepreneur in the island's beauty scene, offers her a job, Bianca accepts, realizing that working on his magazine is the closest to her dreams she'll get. As Bianca begins to embrace her power and creative voice, she starts to suspect Obadiah is not the elite tyrant he seems. She's right. Born in one of the poorest parts of Trinidad, Obadiah has clawed partway up society's ladder and built his company around his meticulously crafted persona. Now he's not about to let anyone, especially Bianca, see past his facade. When Bianca's ex-lover threatens everything she's rebuilt, jeopardizing all she's come to love about her new life, she's surprised to find support from the most unlikely ally and finally draws the strength to fight back like her mother taught her. Sharp-witted and fiercely fun, the god of good looks alternates between Bi Bianca's diary entries and Obadiah's first-person narrative to portray modern Trinidad's rigid class barriers and the fraught impact of beauty commodification. Boisterous, moving, and full of meaty, universally relatable questions. McIver's sparkling debut is an open-hearted awakening tale about prejudice and pride the mask we wear, and what who we can become if we dare to take them off. This is another synopsis writer where it's like they were doing their job. That was excellent. All right, that is it for my summer book haul. Thank you so much for watching. Um, if you're not already subscribed, make sure to do that. You can find all of my socials and links down below. If you are in the mood or looking for some bookish merch, Ding, 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 ding. Check out my Etsy shop, which is also linked down below. Stock up on some cozy fall sweaters as we head into colder winter here in the U.S. and the Northern Hemisphere. And I will see you all in the next video. Bye. I ain't living for the moment. I see what's mine and I want it. Hungry like a Pac-Man. Bruce Wayne and Batman. I'm Naruto with a Hanzo. Got a sharp mind like I'm Einstein. Copyright, so it's all mine. Check it for me, I'm in the sky.